Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bishar Dumani, and I will be hosting this special webinar that marks the launch of two special issues of the Jerusalem Quarterly on the theme Palestinian Homes and Houses, Materialities and Subjectivities. The webinar features two of the eight authors uh, <clears throat> that wrote in these two special issues. I'm very happy to have with us here today, Lisa Tarakey and Jacob Norris. Uh, this webinar is a joint event between the Institute for Palestine Studies, uh, which is Jerusalem Quarterly's parent organization, and New Directions in Palestinian Studies, which is an academic initiative based at Brown University and housed under the Center for Middle East Studies. I want to first of all express my sincere thanks to Laurel Bust and Rana Anani on the IPS side and to Barbara Oberketter and Srina Beg on the Brown side for organizing this event. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of my colleagues here at Brown, uh, Alex Winder, uh, was the co-organizer of the NDPS or New Directions of Palestinian Studies workshop, which resulted in these two special issues and other publications. He is uh, unavoidably not with us at this moment, but hopes to, change, uh, to join at a, at a later time. Um, <clears throat> so may I just very quickly give you a quick word about NDPS and JQ. Um, <clears throat> NDPS is an academic initiative. Um, it centers Palestinians in knowledge production projects and makes the Palestinian condition uh, a site for producing theory instead of implementing uh, theories. Uh, we work very hard on cultivating a new generation of scholars in Palestinian studies. Uh, we have honest conversations, especially through our workshops uh, around the internal dynamics of the Palestinian life uh, consideration of which often helps us to think of ways to exceed the colonial paradigm which continues to imprison our discussions uh, of Palestine and the Palestinians. Um, we have workshops once a year and many of them have resulted in special issues. For example, um, a special issue of the uh, journal Palestine Studies uh, from a workshop uh, called uh, 1948 and its Shadows. And for this uh, workshop, we have two special issues, one of the Jerusalem Quarterly, issue number 1983, and another one of the Jerusalem Quarterly, issue nine, uh, number 84 from that conference. Now the Jerusalem Quarterly um, as you know, has been around for some years, um, but over the last year or two, it put a lot of effort into turning it into a first-class peer-reviewed publication. Uh, and it's been a wonderful success step so far. Uh, I really wanna thank the editorial committee for all the work that they've done uh, to making this transition uh, possible. Um, and I want to thank especially uh, Alex Winder, who as executive editor uh, for the past couple of years have uh, taken charge, has taken charge of the peer review process. And I want to welcome uh, Roberto Maza, who is the new executive editor of the journal of, of the uh, Jerusalem Quarterly. Now, in terms of the theme for today's discussion, homes and houses, uh, you have all received in the announcement a fairly lengthy paragraph uh, that conceptualizes the intellectual and political stakes of this theme, and I will not repeat them here. Suffice it to say that houses, of course, are the material nexus really for Palestinian life, uh, and a home, whether inhabited, remembered, or imagined, is the engine room for Palestinian subjectivities. And we bring them together, uh, um, not as two separate categories, but as uh, dynamically and uh, dialectically intertwined uh, discursive and material ways of looking at the Palestinian condition. Um, Jacob Norris will go first, followed by Lisa. They'll speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Uh, we hope to be uh, with together uh, no more than one and a half hours uh, overall. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Jacob uh, Norris, is a senior lecturer in Middle Eastern history at the University of Sussex in the UK. His book, 
Land of Progress, Palestine in the Age of Colonial Development, it was published by Oxford University Press in 2013. His current research is on Bethlehem in the 19th and 20th century. He is uh, a person who has put Bethlehem on the map in so many different ways, and we're very happy to have him here with us. Um, comrade and friend Lisa Taraki uh, is a sociologist and director of the PhD program in the social sciences at Music University. Her research interests revolve around spatial politics and the social history of Palestinian cities. She has written on the social history of Ramallah, including work on Ramallah under the rule of the Palestinian Authority. And her talk today is uh, taken from an article she had on the history of Ramallah itself. Uh, welcome, Jake and Lisa. And we'll start with Jake. OK, thank you very much, Bashara, for that flattering introduction. And I'd just like to start by saying a big thank you to all of the team at Jerusalem Quarterly who have organized this fantastic event, particularly thank you to Laura, uh, to Alex and Bashar. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the article that I've published um, in, this, in one of these two uh, special issues of JQ, <clears throat> which is called Mobile Homes, the, the name of my article, Mobile Homes, Palestinian Merchant Homes in the Late Ottoman Period. So I'd like to start by saying I think there is a stillness in the pre-1948 history of Palestinian society, or at least in the way this history has been written, we might say. Just take as an example Adam Labor's best-selling history of Jaffa, and this is Jaffa, the one place where we might expect to find Palestinians moving around. And I quote, ships left for Jaffa, sorry, ships left Jaffa for Europe, taking away oranges and bringing back Jewish immigrants, end quote. So here it's as if the outside world was something that Palestinians simply waited to receive. There's a cast of Zionist settlers, European missionaries, uh, Russian pilgrims, British colonial officials who flood into Jaffa's docks while the Palestinians themselves look on as passive bystanders. So my, my goal in, in this article was really to introduce the theme of movement when we think about how Palestinians have historically constituted their homes. And of course, the reality is that Palestinians have always been on the move in all manner of different ways. But this movement seems often to get lost between the cracks of the colonial versus indigenous dynamic through which we tend to view Palestine. So by focusing here on Palestinian movement, I in no way want to diminish the colonial nature of Palestinians' encounter with Zionism. Rather, I just want to explore the fluidity, the richness of Palestinian society prior to 1948. And in turn, I suppose, highlight how that fluidity has been eroded by the Zionist colonial project since the creation of Israel. And the particular form of movement that I focus on in the article is the veritable explosion of overseas migration from certain areas of Palestine that began around the 1860s and was part of a wider movement that saw roughly 600,000 people leave Bilad the Shem between the years 1860 and 1914 alone, most of them headed towards the Americas. And in Palestine itself, um, Bethlehem or Bethlehem was a trailblazer of these movements and hence forms the main focus of my article. But I should point out that it's a phenomenon that affected many towns and villages, particularly in the Palestinian hilly interior. Ramallah, Al Bire, Beit Jala, Beit Sahur, just to name a few of them. Most of the migrants were merchants. Um, a majority of them were Christian, but many were also Muslims. The case of Al Bire is particularly instructive on that point. All of them were looking for new ways to profit from, um, from Palestine's increasing incorporation into the capitalist world economy, and in particular from the revolution in steam travel. And most of the migration in the pre-World War I period was circular as migrants tended to go abroad in the hope of earning some quick money and then return home. So the central question in the article becomes, how did this movement affect the ways people built and imagined their homes? And so to answer um, this question, I picked out two of the trends that stood out to me as quite prominent. 
Firstly, the emergence of a new type of material, physical living space outside of Bethlehem's old town that merged interest, in interesting ways, commercial and residential functions. And then secondly, a more of a, an imagined type of home that resulted from the increasingly transient and transnational lifestyles of these residents. And here I argue the family home was reimagined as a network of family members, partners and clients, all embodied by new types of communication and corporate branding. So to start just very briefly um, with the first of these two sections, I just sort of summarize what these two sections talk about. So the first section, look at these kind of physical houses, these material constructions. And I focus on one house in particular, um, known um, or still standing and known in Bethlehem today as Hoshtab Dub, pictured here in different forms on the slide. Um, and for me, the story of this house and the wider road on which it's located, called Rasif Tais, serves as an important corrective, really, to the story of how new bourgeois neighborhoods sprang up outside the old walled towns and cities of Palestine from the mid-19th century onwards. And this is obviously particularly with regards to Jerusalem, where we're very used to hearing a story of Western influence that then prompts kind of later imitations amongst the aspiring local elites. In the case of Bethlehem, this actually looks quite different. This is a trend that was produced by local merchants who were embarking on new overseas trading missions. And thus, we can begin to recast Palestinians as active participants in circuits of globalization and bourgeois sensibilities, I would say. <clears throat> So um, just to start with this actual street. So this is Rasif Tais, which has sort of been rechristened um, Star Street, Sharia Nijme in Bethlehem today. Um, and you see on the left here, a painting by Luigi Mayer from the late um, 18th century, showing the extent to which Bethlehem had previously been contained within its old kind of Mamluk um, walls. And it's sort of clustered along the Eastern end of this ridge that sort of culminates in the Church of the Nativity. <clears throat> Um, you can see sort of to the right hand side of the picture, this archway, which is um, known as Kursa Zarara, which kind of marked the entry point into Bethlehem proper in this period. Um, but then by the time we get to the kind of 1860s, we start to find the first houses being built beyond that point. And on the picture on the bottom right, the, um, the structure that you can actually see in the sort of foreground of that picture, we think um, quite possibly is the sort of earliest version of this house Hoshtab Dub that I was very interested in built roughly around 1860. So what's happening here is as um, Bethlehem uh, artisans are beginning to make the transition into becoming merchants and sort of marketing their goods to increasing numbers of pilgrims, because largely they're selling religious souvenirs or, or, or devotional objects, um, they're beginning to acquire larger amounts of capital and move out of the old town and position themselves at the top of this hill, Rasif Tais, which leads down into Bethlehem. So it's the point at which you turn the corner um, of this road, which today is Star Street, and Bethlehem sort of appears in front of you, a very kind of um, um, emotional, exciting moment for many pilgrims. And Hoshtab Dub is built at this point to get ahead of the competition, really, in order to start um, kind of capitalizing on these increasing pilgrim numbers in the mid to late 19th century. <clears throat> so the street is actually located on the side of it's actually quite a steep hill it wasn't really captured so well in those images um, but it's on the lower side of the road on quite a steep hill and because of this um, the house that was built there had to pioneer a new kind of linear architectural form characterized by these distinctive arches that um, are known as ruach which is a kind of cross vaulted covered corridor that connects the various rooms of the house for a series of these large elegant arches. This is repeated across, this pattern is repeated across two floors and then replicated when the house was later extended, rendering this sort of linear nature all the more striking. And there's lots of stuff going on here, but certainly I think one of the key factors is the kind of double nature of the house. So the front of the house is largely unremarkable, I would say, facing onto the street, just one story is only visible, but from the back of the house, whether it's the back or not, it's difficult to say, but this view we're looking at here faces back across the valley towards Bethlehem itself. And here, obviously, messages of social status are being projected to the rest of Bethlehem, with these striking archways. And then several other houses are built following Hoshtab Dub, each of them 
kind of come up with ever more elaborate designs which face back across the valley. <clears throat> Um, what all of this is really um, signalling is a new kind of demarcation, I would say, between public and private space. So the upstairs, which is only visible at sort of street level, is the kind of business space, in the case of Hoshtab Dub, where we have a shop located to sell the company family goods. We have a workshop of Mother of Pearl carvers producing those goods. But the, the downstairs space is the private family space, but it's also a place to project back um, across to the rest of the town in terms of social status. Uh, and I would say that this is quite similar in a way to the Nabulsi mansions built a little later at the end of the 19th century um, in assault, such as those of the Abu Jabar and Tukan families who split their businesses across both sides of the River Jordan in the late 19th century. And in the process, they very much redefined the old center of assault by constructing uh, spacious shops and warehouses, particularly along Shar al Hammam and Shar al Khadir. And these are top, in the case of assault, these, these merchant houses are topped by very luxurious living quarters. <clears throat> okay, um, on the left here, you can see a photo of uh, this Rasif Tay Street in Bethlehem uh, by the end of the 19th century, or turn of the 20th century, when it's become a, a sort of almost continuous line of new mansions built that followed Hoshtab Dub up the hill um, and a sort of street life uh, resulting. Um, on the right, you can see a quote, which I just kind of leave you to have a look at, um, which indicates the extreme mobility of these Bethlehem merchant families by the end of the 19th century. <clears throat> um, but in the, it's in the second part of the article, I move on to look at a more imagined type of home that results from this mobility that you can sense there. Um, by this stage, so by, certainly by the turn of the 20th century, this, this, the previously centralized, I would say, highly patriarchal structure of the Bethlehem family firms was giving way to a more kind of horizontal relationship between siblings who were living and moving across multiple locations with Bethlehem no longer constituting a kind of center of gravity. And among other things, I explain how this opened up new forms of uh, gender relations as women played increasingly prominent roles in business affairs overseas, whereas previously they'd been confined to a kind of newly created role of bourgeois domesticity. And to examine how these transnational or if you like mobile homes were imagined, um, I looked at the ways that these families branded themselves in the corporate marketplace, logos, letterheads, telegraphic signatures, um, as well as the often very emotional languages they employed in various types of correspondence between uh, among themselves. So in look at these various kinds of sources, I, I've, one of the things that emerged to me, or one of the things I found useful was this Arabic, particularly Shami Arabic um, distinction between dar as a word for home on the one hand, and then bait or manzil. For me, this became a useful route into thinking about the notion of home as dar, as a series of family networks that had become increasingly uh, de-anchored from any kind of physical material space. So just to sort of draw this to some kind of conclusion, um, I think in the end I came back to this idea that to be Palestinian is inherently connected to movement and that this movement has had a massive impact on how Palestinian homes are built and conceptualized. Looking at merchants in the late 19th century is just one way, one route into this discussion. Um, today, I would say feelings of dislocation, exile, being in two places um, or multiple places while perhaps being in none of them are all common um, experiences for Palestinians. But we also need to historicize these, these experiences. And th this mobility of the late 19th and early 20th century was in many ways, I think, different to Palestinian transnationalism today. The Ottoman, the, the late Ottoman period, was at least for towns like Beit Lahem, one of greater fluidity and a movement largely born of choice and opportunity. Already by the 1920s, British colonial rule was beginning to curtail that movement, foreshadowing the more comprehensive restrictions that would be imposed by successive generations of Israeli occupation. Okay, I'll um, leave it there and hand over to Lisa. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Jake. Lisa, you need to unmute. Yes, indeed. Okay, first of all, I want to thank everyone for organizing this from Laura Albas to Shara to Salim Damari, Rana Anani, etc. <clears throat> now, I'm to speak today 
on the hidden history of Ramallah. So I would like to explain first what this is about. And I also wish to say that I really had not thought much about houses and homes, the theme of this event, when I wrote the article uh, in this issue of JQ, beyond noting the feverish devotion to building houses and acquiring land by Ramallah natives and emigres from the closing decades of the 19th century. But I will try to make a few comments on that after a very brief outline of what I have to say about Ramallah's social history. Now, what motivated me to work on the social history of Ramallah was the near total absence of the story of small towns and of the urbanizing trajectory in Palestine beyond the larger cities of Jaffa, Jerusalem, and Haifa. These small towns still remain largely invisible in the scholarly literature. In particular, I was interested in tracing the emergence of a parochial, inward-looking, and quite ordinary middle class in the small town of Ramallah, in contrast which, with the much celebrated cosmopolitan urban middle class in, in the coastal cities and Jerusalem. My protagonists, the people that I was interested in, the sons and daughters of this class were first and foremost family people, both as they ventured out into the diaspora or stayed at home to manage livelihoods and homes. They were largely oblivious to the public doings of prominent lawyers, writers, politicians, business people who have fascinated scholars for several years now. The fragments of their lives that are available to us, culled from interviews, local histories and genealogies, records in the Ramallah municipality archive, diaries, photographs, newspaper advertisements, etc., paint a picture of a group of people whose main preoccupation was the prosperity of the family. The extent to which any of them participated in local politics or institutions was dictated by very local and immediate material and social interests. Now, emigration to the US, and I note that emigration to the US had unique uh, contours and effects, and when it was not for the purpose of higher education, tended to have a parochializing effect, paradoxically. It shaped individuals who did not incline to public careers or the fashioning of modern personas. The majority of the Ramallah emigres were not merchants and not of great means. They were at best modest landowners with a rudimentary education, but a great deal of ambition. The first Ramallah emigrants were in the main peddlers as they were Tujar Shanta, as they were called, who later settled uh, in urban and some rural areas in the US. Now the vast majority of these people became integrated into the American everyday business world as their material conditions improved. Their periodic visits to their hometown did not leave any durable modernizing traces apart from the modern houses that they built. Many of these houses still dot the landscape in Ramallah. I must note that these home, the grand homes, the grander and the more modest are documented in the superb book by Nazmi Jabe and Khatun Bishara uh, called Ramallah Architecture and History published by Rewaq in 2002. This book along with these uh, photographs uh, has a lot of insights into the people who built uh, these homes and, and inhabited them. I also want to note a recent and very long historical novel 
uh, set in Ramallah over a 150 year period from the end of the 19th century by the writer and sociologist Abad Yahya. This is the book, very thick. Uh, the narrators in this novel are, in fact, the doorsteps, the atabat, or the stairs of the home of the Najjar family, Dar Najjar, each narrating the trials and tribulations of the generations then, that went in and out of this house. So I would recommend this novel uh, for those who might be able to get it. Uh, the building of a house meant stability and prosperity of the family to the majority of the immigrants, as well as those who stayed in the homeland. Equally important was the acquisition of land for investment or for agriculture. Most families prided themselves in their dedication to the land, their attachment to it, not necessarily in terms of working the land themselves, but an active oversight of the very various cycles, uh, stages of the agricultural cycle. And I dare say that the Bethlehemite merchant elite that Jake has just talked about, despite their cosmopolitan outlooks, likely shared this prevailing sensibility. Indeed, I think awareness of peasant roots continues to be an aspect of identity among Bethlehem families to this day, as attested to by various memorializing practices in the town. Now, Ramallah, even before the mandate, found itself paradoxically at the vanguard of what you might call the away from home holiday. The idea of its summer holiday making. It originated in Lebanon, and Ramallah became a magnet to the same urban clientele who spent part of their summers in Lebanon. They needed to escape the confinement of home in the sultry heat of the coastal summers and find relief in the fresh air of the hilly country in someone else's house. Even though Ramallah lacked the majestic cedars, and the able clear spring of the Lebanese mountains from the early years of the 20th century, its homeowners invested much effort to cater to the elite desire to flee home through renting rooms and houses to the summer visitors. Later, during the 1930s and 40s, Ramallah became the site par excellence of summer revelry in the several hotels built especially to cater to the Palestinian urban upper and middle class, including those from uh, further places such as Cairo and Amman. The considerable scholarly literature on tourism and leisure at the turn of the 20th century in Gadisham is almost entirely written with a focus on the lives and sensibilities of the bourgeois and aspiring middle classes, clients of establishments such as hotels and summer resorts. We know very little about the lives of those who serve those clients, the invisible and nameless villagers who rented their homes to the coastal bourgeoisie and serviced their needs. Uh, Yasmin Zahran, her novel, El Lahn al Awad, expresses perfectly the sentiments of Ramallah natives who were invaded each summer by the Jaffa elite, especially the haughty women who paraded around their town sporting Madani accents and elegant clothing. This, she's writing her memories from the mid. 1940s. Now, I'll end by saying that throughout much of the period I have studied, Ramallah people were not trying to become someone else. They felt rooted in the place they claimed as home, 
despite the vagaries of immigration and the momentous events that would change everyone's life with the Nakba. The associations they formed in exile in the United States are a testament to that, as are the several local town histories available to us, written by Ramallah people. While some of these histories extol the progress of Ramallah over the years, they invariably fall back on the groundedness of the people in the land and the presumed timelessness of their customs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. What a, a great commitment by both speakers to limit their time to 10 minutes, even though they have so much to say. It's, thank you very much. Uh, this will give us more time to entertain any questions and comments uh, that Laura uh, Bust will be forwarding to me, uh, which you can put on chat on Zoom or through a link in Facebook. Um, May I just do a couple more plugs? Since you plugged a couple of nice things, Lisa. One is Rajesh Hadi's book, uh, Going Home, a walk through 50 years of occupation, which speaks directly. To, he was one of the Jaffa elites, I suppose, that came to Ramallah at that time about the interaction between them and their and and the houses and their gardens. And, and it's just a wonderful book that, that speaks to many of the issues that you raised. And uh, a book by the late Samih Hamoudi on the history of Ramallah. Uh, Samih was a student of mine at Birzeit University back in the early 80s. Uh, uh, and uh, it's one of several books actually that have come out on Ramallah in, in recent years. Um, and um, uh, so this is an exciting uh, field of, of, of writing these days. So thank you. May I, while we wait for some questions, uh, and I will, I see that uh, there's some already that are arriving. Please continue. C can I ask, uh, can I begin by asking uh, both Lisa and Jake about uh, the question of family? Uh, because whenever you say home or house, family is maybe the next most often mentioned word. Um, <clears throat> and specifically, what can you tell us briefly about the Important say uh, stops or observations that you have to make about the changing nature of the family over this period. How is family understood and how is it organized? Um, perhaps if that's too general a question, let me know. I can narrow it down, but I thought I would throw it out uh, in this general form so you can choose whatever direction you want to take. Jake? Yeah, thanks, Bashara. I, I think above all, I, I would follow your lead as, as you've written about extensively on the um, importance of not assuming that family is some kind of fixed entity, which just sort of sits embedded within social structures in a kind of timeless fashion. And so one of the things we're seeing here is the, obviously the intertwining of family and home and how that shifts. Um, I think in both of our, uh, both of our sort of short presentations, as a result of, of movement and, and migration. So in the, in the case of Bethlehem, but I think this can be expanded out more broadly, uh, families are becoming increasingly, um, well, I would say that in, certainly in the case of Bethlehem, they're turning into almost corporate entities by the end of the 19th century. And that produces shifts in gender relations. It produces shifts in the structures of the families. One of the things that I found really useful was to look at the parish records um, that were at least are available for the, 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 the Latin or Catholic population in Bethlehem, which constitutes a small majority of Bethlehem's Christian population. And there I sort of took a snapshot of one family, the Dabdub family, which um, built that house I was talking about, and looked at things like age of marriage, um, uh, number of children per family, all of these kind of questions over the entire Dabdub family records that go back to the, 1600, the late 1600s. And I found really interesting, by the end of the 1900s, the average age of, um, of female marriage was dropping considerably to around 14, between 14 and 15 years old, whereas previously it had been up at around 17 years old. 
and also the number of children per um, per per family was increasing as well. And for me, I mean, there are various ways you might interpret that, but for me, this was a sign that families were, um, on the one hand, becoming um, more wealthy, so able to support more children, but also this premium placed on producing sons who would play this role of being sent out on overseas trading missions to establish new kind of um, trade posts abroad. So it became a very disciplined, I would say, quite centralized family structure, very patriarchal. Um, but that also that model contained within it the seeds for a further change which happened once these families became so dependent upon overseas trade, they needed to establish permanent bases around the world in order to sustain those business networks, which meant that they sort of fattened down to more horizontal structures and particularly then the, the, the importance of the kind of nuclear family, if we might call it that, started to kick in with couple husband and wife living in various locations around the world. Um, and that produces interesting changes in gender relations as well. I mean, I could go on there, but I think it's that sort of corporatization, almost the family structure, which really stood out to me in the case of Bethlehem. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Lisa? Well, in the quite different case of Ramallah, uh, where you don't have the, the movement involves different kinds of people. I think um, it would be important to uh, specify what historical period one is talking about. I think at least until about the 30s of the 20th century, uh, migration was largely a male affair and therefore, um, the absence of the men for quite long periods sometimes um, meant some rearrangement of family uh, structures. And I think the uh, more well-known um, example of this is found in the neighboring uh, village town of Elbire, where proverbially the women there have been managing uh, homes for a long time. But uh, really um, the movement out of Ramallah changed with the 40s and uh, particularly, of course, uh, after the uh, there was sort of wholesale emigration of Ramallah people to the United States and then an influx of uh, other people, refugees and others. So the whole history of Ramallah in the 50s, beginning in the 50s, is something really that has not been studied in, in terms of the demographics and many of the important things that one would need to look at, uh, such as nuclearization of families, what types of people, that's some of the research that I'm uh, still doing, what types of people came to settle. Because today, Ramallah is maybe 80% uh, not, uh, uh, I mean, the, the population are not the original Ramallah people. So uh, that's a whole different thing and obviously the nuclear family today, according to many statistics, is obviously everywhere in the West Bank, but particularly in Ramallah, the dominant form. But anyway, it's a long history, and I think one has to sort of periodize the issue a bit. If I could just come in there, Bashar, it's fascinating yeah. listening to Lisa speaking, and it really brings out for me the importance of local specificity when we talk about Palestinian families. So often it's a category that's essentialized. Um, yeah. Whether we're, you know, and, and the context of the local economy as right. a term factor and how these structures take up and then change over time. So the differences between Ramallah and, and Beit Lahem, think about your work on Nablus, Bashada, with the importance of the olive economy in terms of the city's hinterland and so on and so forth. So it almost becomes impossible to start talking about <laughs> 
the Palestinian family in the whichever period we're talking about, I think. Yeah. Uh, point well taken. You're preaching to the converted, of course, on this issue. Um, let me read some some of the questions. There's several of them. Um, I'll start where, in terms of what was received first, um, but I'll do maybe three or four in one round, and you can answer, and then we'll go through another round. First is from Salim Tamari, who, as you know, is the driving force behind Jerusalem Quarterly and its leader for many, many years. I joined as a co-editor only a year or so or more ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, and Salim uh, says, thanks to Paraki and Norris for two marvelous presentations. Can you comment on the relationship between Beit Lahem and Ramallah in terms of building activity? In particular, the role of Beit Lahem and Beit Jala builders in the construction of Ramallah mansions in the 1930s and 1940s. See it, for example, in Abad Yahya's novel about the history of Ramallah homes. One from Hiba Najada. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. The distinction between Dar and Beit or Menzel is particularly fascinating. Can you expand on this and the ways in which this distinction maps onto the physical house and the imagined one? Um, yeah, so that's a great question and something I could say something about as well. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. One from Aboud, uh, is it uh, Ashhab? Uh, why did many Palestinians from Beit Lahem specifically immigrate to the Latin American country, Chile? And why did they, many of them stay? Uh, finally, from uh, for this round, from Bettina Marx, uh, can you tell us something about the sources for your respective research? Where do you find your sources and documents and what archives can researchers find material? Shall we um, do a quick round? We're starting with maybe Lisa this time. Okay. Uh, Salim uh, answered his own question. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Yes, I mean, th this is more or less, but I must say that um, there's still a lot to know about who these uh, builders were. Uh, and uh, it's sort of become a sort of a taken for granted fact that these were Bethlehem, uh, masters, master craftsmen who, uh, and then of course also the story goes, I mean, there are a lot of stories which are repeated and they take on a certain uh, life of their own uh, that these people uh, encourage the Ramallah uh, sort of uh, peasants who were still new to, uh, the world to, to emigrate and to follow their uh, footsteps. So I think, uh, of course, the problem is, and maybe I will deal with, with the issue of sources here, the question that Bettina Marx asked, if I may, Shara, right now, in relation to this. The, the problem is that uh, in terms of Ramallah, and I'm sure it's true of many, many other places, there are a certain number of local histories that keep reproducing each other's uh, uh, narratives, stories, uh, mythologies, uh, etc. So in order to get beyond that, uh, I think it's very important to be able to have uh, a sort of a window into uh, the lives of people through other sources. And uh, unfortunately, the people that I uh, was interested in, in studying were not the intellectual types who wrote diaries or uh, memoirs or anything of the sort. However, it's possible, and here I uh, relied on uh, many things, including uh, uh, photographic collections, and the, the rich material available in the Ramallah municipality archives, which are not classified or, or um, 
how shall I say, organized uh, with the kinds of information that one wants in mind. But I think that if you're creating creative enough, uh, you, you can begin to piece through uh, the stories. And also to go to um, uh, second, secondary um, individuals, I meant to, to uh, sort of double check on uh, family narratives and things like that. It's kind of painstaking. But I think it's rewarding. It can, it can be done, especially when there is no written record uh, of any kind. Can I come in there, Lisa, and, I, and just ask you what what are those myths that you say are reproduced in the kind of global narratives and histories? Ah, uh, well, first of all, there's the founding myth. You know, the the migration, the the the. Um, migration of the Hadadin from uh, East Jordan to Ramallah. That's one of the uh, uh, enduring uh, stories. And in fact, today uh, at the uh, plaza of the new municipality building, there's a rather big sculpture which depicts, uh, you know, this, uh, family's uh, migration. And then there are many other mythologies, uh, particularly you see, because this is a Christian town, um, the historians, the local historians were very keen on showing always the uh, amicable relationships with the surrounding Muslim villagers and particularly those in Bire, which were right next door. So there's a great deal of, uh, you know, mismaking, in my opinion, which sometimes uh, creeps into scholarly work and academic work. And I think that one has to take a very skeptical view of all these uh, uh, mythologies, uh, you know, which are promoted I mean, Ramallah today is trying to market itself uh, or was before the pandemic, but it'll be back, uh, market itself, you know, as a, as a very attractive uh, uh, cultured place, et cetera, with this very unique history. So uh, it's these the mythologies, the stories, and there are many others find their way in the, you know, the material, promotional material that's put out by the Baladiya and the tourism promotion uh, people, et cetera. So I think, um, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure I, I know that there are other uh, studies, scholarly works on examining village uh, histories, you know, and uh, so there's always this issue. Uh, but, but of course, I mean, maybe, sorry, last word, the myths themselves say something about how the people, um, you know, look at themselves and what, what they think is worth uh, preserving. Yeah, I find them fascinating for what they tell us about identity, yes. about the stories that people tell themselves, and what that tells us about society more broadly, I suppose, because every, yeah, as you say, every Palestinian town and village has their kind of their narratives or their myths, and then that breaks down into individual groups of families, Hamatil, et cetera. So it's um, yeah. going to be very interesting from an anthropological point of view, I suppose. Sorry, Lisa, I didn't want to interrupt you. Are you, are you still working your way through? No. Halas, I'm done. You can go ahead. Yeah, don't, don't feel I don't obliged think to gonna... answer every single question, but do your best. Um, I think we should bring in your expertise as well, Bashada, um, at various points. Uh, Salim's question uh, on the connections between Bethlehem and Ramallah in terms of the stone masons. I think it's such an important part of, of Bethlehem's history is the proximity of the town to those large um, um, deposits, lime scale deposits in the hills to the south of Bethlehem in particular. One of the most, the richest um, such deposits in the world, and it obviously defines Jerusalem's urban development as well as the whole surrounding area. 
Uh, and so you have certain families in Bethlehem, such as Abu Jarur, Sabag, two of the families I know that kind of specialized or ended up branch of those families specializing in uh, stone masonry um, and the sale of, of, those, of that quarried stone. So it's a, it's a huge part of the story of the architecture, but also the social history of these towns. I don't know if Lisa can say more about specific houses in, in Ramallah that were built by, you know, who were, the, who were the masons, the builders building these, these houses. It's a question that's of, of, often quite elusive, I think. Um, but it also, alert, for me, it, it alerts or brings up the question of kind of social stratification. So, you know, I would, I would always be tempted to see a, a town like Bethlehem and perhaps Ramallah as well as a market town which is, it's not just a small village to the south of Jerusalem, it's a center in itself. It's a market town, which literally every Saturday attracts huge numbers of villages, um, as well as Bedouin from the surrounding area. So it's a magnet. And for that reason, the people who actually often built these houses were not from Bethlehem itself. They were laborers who would come into the town, um, attracted by this new sort of wave of wealth creation. I think a lot more work needs to be done on that. And I think going back to the question of sources, so often it's a question of well, whose voices can we hear in these sources, but also how can we read between the lines and, and expand on those kind of social differences that, that emerge in these processes. Um, just one thing I'd say on the differences between Bethlehem and Ramallah, there's there, one of the sources that, um, we, well, I've been involved in a project that's collecting all sorts of different sources related to Bethlehem's migration history. And one of the sources which Salim himself knows well is the um, sources related to a woman called um, Katrina Saade, who was um, born in Bethlehem in 1900 and at a very young age was sort of shunted around the world to different places, married off at the age of 13 to a man in Mexico, later came back to Palestine. What's really fascinating about her story is when she, she marries a man in California, in um, Long Beach, California, um, from a Ramallah family, the Farhat family, and he persuades her to come back in the early 30s to, to Palestine itself. And um, she goes ahead while he stays in California, tying up the family business. And when she is back in Ramallah, she's living with his in-laws. And there seems to be a very strong clash between those two. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, this is a, a sort of patriarchal um, structure where she's used to a relative level of independence um, as a woman living abroad and moving between multiple locations. And suddenly that's being curtailed. So there's the kind of gender dimension to that. But you also get, you know, through some of the photographs of that collection and the letters themselves, this sense of Bethlehemites viewing the, the Ramallah families as quite um, parochial, quite sort of old fashioned. Um, and then that's expressed in some of the photographs where, for example, the two families line up for a family picture and you see the uh, Ramallah section of the family um, still uh, dressed in what we might call sort of traditional, quote unquote, traditional forms of dress, and the Bethlehemites are in kind of um, shirts and suits and, and, and different forms of dress. So you see these kind of clashing um, cultures and histories coming out in those kinds of episodes. Uh, I don't know if we should, I mean, there was a question, there were several questions, weren't there? Should, would you like um, me to? Tackle another one. If you have something quick to say, I think because in fairness, we need to move on to the other questions soon. Uh, just a quick question then that um, that Abud um, Ashhab raised about why did Palestinians from Bethlehem specifically emigrate? Um, I just happened to have with me this football shirt, <laughs> which is the football team Club Palestino, which was founded by Bethlehem migrants in Chile in 1920. And you can see, this is a kind of recent football shirt and you can see the colors of the Palestinian flag. Uh, the sponsor obviously is Bank Philistine. Um, there is an image of the um, Dome of the Rock in the center of the shirt. And then most um, controversially, this is a, a version of the shirt from 2014. Every time there's a number Every time there's a number one on this shirt, it's the map of historic Palestine. And there's also a sizable Jewish community in Chile, which protested against this particular version of the shirt, saying it was denying the right of Israel to exist, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually the club was fined and the shirt had to be changed. So it's fascinating how you find these the sort of Palestinian struggle and polemics being mapped out into a Latin American context. 
for those um, of you who don't know, Chile holds more holds the largest Palestinian population in the world outside of the Middle East itself, um, around half a million people of Palestinian origin. Most of them trace their origins to Beit Jala and Bethlehem. And I think um, to try to make the answer of why they went there short, these were, these were migrations of large numbers of Syrians from across below the Sham, particularly from Mount Lebanon. And the Palestinians were often trying to um, search out niches places where there weren't other traders of their type. And everywhere they went, they often found Syrians or Lebanese in large numbers in the ports of Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, the kind of big emerging centers of the west coast of Latin America. So it's clear that some of them started to sort of push on and keep looking for places that were favorable to their kind of trade, but also away from those um, clusters of Syrian communities. And there are some amazing stories of Bethlehemites attempting to cross the Andes um, to get to the western side of South America from Argentina. Um, a bit later on traveling by boat around Cape Horn, um, equally, well, in many ways, equally dangerous journey around the Southern Pacific, uh, sorry, Atlantic and into the Pacific. So this is a sort of, I suppose, above all, a search for new trading places that were not already crowded out by sort of like-minded Syrian merchants who were fanning out in all directions in the Americas. Thanks, Jake. Um, we have several more questions. Let me just quickly say about Dar and Beit that, of course, one of the first things we notice is that they're used both for physical location as well as the family, Beit Fulan or Dar Fulan. Uh, the northern part of Bilad de Sham often uses Beit, and the southern part of Bilad de Sham often uses Dar, but in legal documents, they're both mixed and it really depends on the region, and they have enormous significance in terms of how people thought of family and how it should be organized and so on and so forth. And we can discuss that maybe at some other special event. Let me go on to the question by Orinir. Given the centrality of home and house in Palestinian popular culture as a societal value, how is the policy of home demolition viewed by Palestinians today beyond the physical damage to property? How do Palestinians view home demolitions on a social cultural level? Yara uh, al thank you for the rich presentations. A question to Jacob. Were there any particularities to merchant houses in Bethlehem that set them apart from those in other Ottoman cities of the late 19th century? And to what extent did the commodity in which these merchants were trading affect the layout and spaces of their houses, if at all? Um, Faisal, uh, is it? Uh, Maruki. Uh, now, in Palestinian fiction, there are diverse manifestations of imaginary homes and homelands. Um, um, how does this relate to the perceptions of home and house that you have elaborated on? And I'll maybe an, add another question by Fayet Meray. Meray. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentations to Dr. Norton. You have said something to the effect of to be Palestinian is to be mobile. Can you elaborate? Why read or focus on the Abdub family mobility as a marker for being Palestinian rather than being bourgeois? Granted, they are not mutually exclusive. Shall we start with you, Jake, this time? Sure, yeah. Um, so to go to Ayara's question about the distinctiveness of the of the Bethlehem houses. Um, I th so at the end of the 19th century, the, the houses like the Hoshtab Dub that I was describing, uh, I think they are playing around with new architectural forms, particularly this kind of linear, elongated linear structure, which I wouldn't say necessarily is unique to Bethlehem. And I've sort of mentioned some similar characteristics in places like Salt due to the Nabulsi merchants um, moving and trading across the River Jordan. Um, so I think they're part of a, of a wave of new experimentations and particularly in this question of you know, the commodities they were trading in, these were families who had become specialized, particularly in the mother of pearl carving trade. A uh, whole history, which I won't go into now of why Bethlehem became a big center for mother of pearl carving of devotional objects. Um, but this required workshops, quite large spaces, 
where as the families became more successful, they employed um, larger numbers of people to of, of local carvers to actually do the carving. Uh, and so the houses were designed with this in mind. So you had this kind of two tiered layout in houses like Hosh Dabdub, and it's quite common in the mansions along, along Rasif Tais in that period, where the top layer would be dedicated to the shop sitting alongside a workshop. And um, so this is sort of business section of the house, if you like, and the family sits, the family life, the private spaces sit relatively hidden below street level um, because the house drops down the hillside from, from street level. So it's, for me, it was that kind of combination of uh, commercial and residential functions, which made these houses quite um, interesting, not necessarily unique. Just to sort of um, bring that story to um, to a close, by the time you get to around 1900, the first decade of the 20th century, an entirely new kind of mansion is being built by the most successful of these elite Beth Bethlehem merchant uh, families. And they are built with this um, sort of pink colored um, Soleil Mizzi stone, which is one of the types of limestone deposits found in that area, more expensive, but also ornamental. Um, and they are houses which are completely detached from the local um, urban landscape. They're located further away from the center of Bethlehem, and they stand as these very ostentatious mansions that are doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things in terms of their architectural form, combining very um, self-consciously European architectural forms. You see neoclassical, you see Renaissance in there, you have turrets, you have various kinds of kind of balustrade, balconies, borrowed directly from European genres, but also giving them kind of low twists, I think, to signal families' rootedness in the local areas. They have pointed archways, um, various kind of Islamic motifs um, sort of embedded in there as well. So there are a riot of different styles in this quite striking kind of pinky colored stone, which I think is quite unique to Bethlehem in that period, but you see them dotted around Jerusalem as well, because of course these Bethlehemite merchants were increasingly buying up property and building houses in Jerusalem, especially in the west and the south of Jerusalem. Uh, Lisa? Well, uh, actually, I don't think there was any question Oops. for me, but I, if I may, uh, Jake asked a question about uh, who built uh, the homes in Ramallah, the houses. And uh, frankly, I, I don't know, but I wish that this were not a webinar, but rather a regular Zoom thing, so that either Khaldun Ibshara or uh, Nazmi Jabe, who are the authors of this book, Ramallah, uh, which is a, a could, could uh, contribute. Uh, I know that some of the stone, the Slayib stone that's from the Betlehem area is used extensively in some of these buildings, but uh, I don't know about the, uh, the workmen. And also another uh, interesting uh, topic, which I tried to find out from some families in Ramallah who had these uh, larger homes is who the architects were, you know, did they have, architects or was it just uh, sort of borrowing plans from buildings that they've seen in Jerusalem, maybe in Bethlehem? Anyway, that's... Um... Through the miracle of technology, Lisa, your wish can come true. Uh, we can... Uh, ah, look... there he is! Yeah. <laughs> and Nazmi, oh, that's great. Yeah, and Khaldun oh, also had a question what? actually, so... Hello, How are you? Good, good. Please, uh, you want to comment on this question? So, Khaldun, you had a question for everybody, but also you were asked the question about who built the Ramallah homes. Uh, I, I read your wonderful book with Nazmi. I recommend it to anyone, and we should put in a special plug for Rewak, which is done wonderful work and published wonderful books over many years on these and related issues. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Khaldun. Thank you. Nazmi maybe want to... to, to... I, I, I tried to connect... Oh, here he is. Yeah, yeah he's All right. here. Nazmi Jabi, 
Um, yeah. Please, Khaldun, go ahead, and I, I will come after you. Okay. Yes, also exactly. connected to Iraq, and now with Iraqi university. Okay, you can. Go ahead. The missing links that I will talk about, but we know for sure that Ramallahites uh, were building peasant houses, very simple ones, towards the mid 19th century, and with the turn of the mid 19th century, they start to build missionaries and churches and the schools, and this was beyond their capabilities, so they had to borrow. Uh, builders somewhere else, and those builders were from Bethlehem. They say four of them. Yeah, uh, builders. I don't know the names, but we know the the name of the builders in Ramallah, Darsa, Darsa yeah. were the builders in Ramallah, and we know that there were plans. Some borrowed from Jerusalem, some from Jewish architects as well as the Beit Nur uh, Abdel Nur in Ramallah was by that architect. In the municipality, we found multiple plans, uh, designed houses, especially from 1920s, uh, uh, and showed that the people, they were, had architects and engineers who are capable to perform these uh, structures. But the, the idea that Ramalites were copying from Jerusalem and Bethlehem and the builders from Bethlehem, it was from the oral history because when the builders of Bethlehem came to Ramallah to build missionaries and large churches, they were talking about immigration that had started in Bethlehem earlier. And they opened the uh, convention of the traveling abroad or immigration. That's the story. That is the story. <laughs> they told them that our, grand, our fathers and brothers went to America and found the dollars in the street. And they wanted to go and bring dollars from the streets everywhere, the green, the green money. And so they started this, and uh, you, we know the first guy who immigrated, 1896, uh, Yusuf Audi Bini, who started a long uh, history of construction and traditions and the Grand Hotel is their creation, that the Bini is a creation. And we know that the Bini is, uh, just to, to stop here, the Dubinis were the last people to come from Jordan to Ramallah, and they were the first to immigrate to America, which shows that Ramallah was not so attractive for them and wanted to explore some, something else. Anyway, this is my uh, intervention, and Nazmi can... Thanks, thanks, Khaldun. You're welcome. Uh, Nazmi? I will try to be very short, otherwise I will take an hour to answer this question. Um, Look, the first maybe modern building ever built in European style was in Jerusalem by Ibrahim Basha ibn Muhammad Ali, um, uh, uh, which is the Kushlak of Jerusalem around uh, 1838. Um, may, this, uh, we don't know much about the building. Uh, we know it's uh, bland structure, etc. But who built it is not clear. The second step in the uh, intrusion, I will say, of modern architecture came uh, with uh, Christ Church in Jerusalem. In the middle of the uh, 19th century, and there is a very interesting uh, uh, information in it, uh, in the history of, of that building. First, that most of the technicians, builders who built it came from Malta brought by the, uh, 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 the uh, London Society for Converting the Jews uh, to build the Christ Church. And they invited some uh, builders or uh, skill, uh, skillful people from Bethlehem to join them the work. Uh, this is maybe the earliest information that we have about the introduction of modern architecture which is not the, our traditional architecture with the cross vaults, etc., especially using uh, uh, um, tiled roofs or flat roofs, which is a, a, a new technique in the Palestinian architectural history. So Maltese taught Bethlehemites how to build modern buildings. Uh, maybe this is a, a, the oldest information that I got. But I want to add to the discussion maybe something that I worked on it recently, which is Lifta. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Lislayeb, the, that uh, uh, stone, uh, uh, the reddish stone 
which came from uh, the mountains of Bejala, was not only limited to Bejala, it was also in El Malha and Lifta. The quarries of Lifta were uh, a main source for middle, uh, modern buildings in Jerusalem as well as in Ramallah. Uh, and Liftawis also were very famous. For instance, there were something like 20 kins of lime in, 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 in uh, uh, Lifta, as well as Kassarat uh, 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 of uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, supplying the market uh, with, with, with these uh, uh, materials for Jerusalem and, and Ramallah. And uh, also the Lifta was very, were very um, advanced muallimin, uh, muallim uh, buna, just a builder with, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, basic uh, uh, architectural uh, skills. Uh, this information I can add to discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have with us now uh, Alex Wunder, who I introduced earlier. I just wanted to make sure he gets a chance to participate in this as he was the co-organizer with me for the uh, workshop that uh, produced these papers, as well as, of course, a colleague on Jerusalem Quarterly and as a, a then uh, executive editor of Jerusalem Quarterly. Uh, welcome, Alex. Uh, please feel free to jump in at any moment. Uh, thank you, Bashadar. Um, and, you know, I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join from the beginning of the event, but even in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I feel like I've, I've learned more than I did in uh, the thing that took me away from the first hour. Um, so I, I, and of course, you know, it was a pleasure to read and to work on um, the workshop, but also the articles for Jerusalem Quarterly. And and so I don't have a question since I'm, you know, coming in late. I don't know exactly what's been covered so far. So I don't want to um, uh, kind of re repeat anything. But, but one thing I was struck in kind of thinking about both the articles, and if this hasn't been addressed yet, maybe um, both uh, Jacob and, and uh, Lisa can, can comment on it, is the kind of the 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 variety of different kinds of sources that you use to to write these articles which really pulled on such a kind of vast array of different kinds of material which really kind of stood out and and really kind of produced such such rich uh, articles so i was wondering if um if that hasn't been discussed yet if maybe you want to kind of say a little bit about the the sources and how you went about kind of reconstructing these these stories uh, I think it has actually come up, uh, but it, it's such an important point. I will only say one quick thing, which is for stateless people, often what you have to do is uh, the very process of creating a set of sources or archives is in itself a form of, of uh, intervention in knowledge production that is very political uh, and that actually, um, uh, creates a new forms of scholarship. And I, I think we, if we follow closely uh, the ways that this, especially younger scholars, but many others are finding uh, things where nobody ever even thought of before or expected to find before uh, in order to create narratives that have been marginalized or erased for so long uh, is one of the wonderful things about Palestinian studies today, which is making an impact on other uh, regional studies. I, they're learning a lot from how Palestinian studies is moving forward in this direction. So thank you for raising that point. Um, can I just, we only have less than 15 minutes left, a whole bunch of questions. We can't get to all of them, um, but um, I, let, let me just throw a couple uh, at you um, that, you know, uh, one is by Khaldun Bshara <laughs> uh, himself. Um, um, the, the questions keep coming in, so my screen uh, keeps moving. Give me a second. Let me start with one by actually Philip Habib. I, I think he was next on the list. Uh, thank you, uh, and I would be thankful for input regarding the dynamics of identity and possible creation of specific cultural spaces. So it's a question about identity and speciality. One by Shadia Tukan. Uh, Tukan. Uh, may I request from Jack to elaborate on the relationship between home and commercial services, as most well-off and Middle East class and middle-class Palestinian families 
um, relied on economic factors, particularly soup and soups, so factories and other income generating outlets. I, I think you know where that question is, is going and that is still true in many ways. So if you comment on that, I think you did a little bit about this the mother of pearl workshops, but if you want to say more, the question by Khaldun, um, uh, thank you. You started the introduction uh, to Samara with the fact that house and home were spaces for familial investment. I want to ask Lisa uh, about something that I did not look into in my own research and writing on Ramallah, and that is, what is the relationship of the Qaysiya immigrants who inhabited or resided in Ramallah houses, especially, but not only in the old town of Ramallah? Uh, do they consider these houses homes? Uh, that is right about the Qaysiya in Albiri and Beit Lahem. Can Jacob also comment on these relations to houses that were turned into, quote, other people's homes? Uh, for those of you with not a big ground on the Qaysiya uh, and Yemeni <laughs> issue, maybe either Lisa or Jake can say something about that. Um, I think uh, Khaldun means the, I know what, what's yeah. called the Qais, the Gisiyya, Qaysiyya. It's Qaysiyya not the Qaysiyya man thing. These are people from the Southern Hebron area who em emigrated to Ramallah. I think Khaldun means that, I think. So you start, why don't you continue, Lisa? Uh, okay, um, I think if, if Khaldun had them in mind, uh, yes, well, first of all, they, didn't make their appearance in Ramallah until much later. So for, I would say for some decades, uh, they weren't really part of the landscape, but these people came as agricultural workers and also as craftspeople to Ramallah. This is another aspect of Ramallah's social history that's not very well studied. Right now in the old city of Ramallah, in uh, uh, a qu quite a, a wide area, and of course the Rewak has done work there. Uh, the, they, they started out living in those areas. And I would say Khaldun that probably yes, they uh, feel like they're at home or they are at home, uh, I do understand that a lot of these people are hanging on to uh, their residences in the older parts of town in the hope that some developers will come and demolish the place and build some uh, high rises and they can get a good uh, clue, you know. So uh, uh, I don't know, some of these uh, homes are quite dilapidated. And uh, really the underclass of Ramallah, you might say, lives there. Uh, but these are not by and large refugees. So you don't have the issue of home and, and, uh, and camp. So particularly in the case of refugees, because that's a whole other dynamic. So I think in this case, uh, I, I would venture that uh, they do feel part of the, uh, at home in, in uh, Ramallah in that sense. Um, I think that was all that was for me. Okay, uh, Jake? Yeah, just to continue that discussion, I think one of the interesting differences between Bethlehem and Ramallah is the extent to which it seems like the Ramallahis have managed to hold on to their property in the old town of Ramallah. Whereas in Bethlehem, it's a very common issue to hear families talking about how they've lost their property. Um, families who emigrated and questions of kind of um, absentee property, but also um, local disputes over property ownerships. And that only intensifies after 1948. Um, and so, there is a sense actually amongst, that I've noticed amongst the Talahme, the, the Bethlehemites, that um, they have not been as successful <laughs> as Ramallah in terms of 
maintaining those connections between, if you like, the diaspora, if we can use that word, and the town itself. And that has been to the detriment of Bethlehem's kind of um, urban development. Of course, there's a sort of common story, at least, that you hear from Bethlehemite families. There may be people in the audience here who could comment better on that than myself. Um, there was a question about uh, sort of focusing on, or, yeah, focusing on the economic factors behind this, behind these migrations, and the and the way that transformed homes. What I'm particularly interested in is the way in which these new forms of wealth creation that were taking place and these new networks that were built up seem to draw in all kinds of different actors into this orbit. So I could sort of sit here and sort of talk, I could literally talk for hours about mother of pearl industry in Bethlehem and its importance to producing these migrations. But we can tell that story purely through the perspective of a handful of kind of families in Bethlehem who ultimately became very wealthy as a result of that and miss out perhaps the fact that all kinds of people were drawn into this orbit um, and affected in different ways. So if we talk about stonemasons as, as, as Nazmi and Khaldun were doing, I think the majority of the people who actually built the houses, particularly from the, I would say, 1890s onwards, were, um, were not from the kind of elite families of Bethlehem, but they were from neighboring villages who were attracted to Bethlehem to find work in these increasingly centralized uh, family firms, if you like. And that, I think, just alerts us to the need for much more research that looks at these kind of subaltern perspectives. Um, Christian Dabdoub has mentioned in the chat um, or has recommended Andrew Ross's book, Men of Stone, which is a fantastic book, mostly focused on more recent sort of um, stone masonry and, and the role that Palestinians have played in building Israel effectively. We need to extend that back, historicize it further. Andrew's book looks at the mandate period, but in relatively um, less detail. I think we need to extend that way back into the Ottoman period and think about these kinds of actors who were whose who's labor underpinned all of these developments that we're talking about. I just read a fantastic article, I think it was in the Journal of Palestine Studies by a woman called Carolyn Karlenberg talking about um, um, Arab maids and domestic laborers during the mandate period and the way in which these new bourgeois households and these images of the new Palestinian woman in the 1920s especially was underpinned by the presence of new domestic workers, mostly maids, working in these new mansions, these new households, the very like of which we've been discussing here today. And they can be invisible unless we start to read between the lines. And it's something that article does very well, I think. So I really think that should be a direction that the historiography should, should start to take, and make sure we get a kind of rounded view of this, the changes produced by these, these processes. Thanks, Jake. That is a perfect segue to uh, my concluding remarks over just the next couple of minutes before we all go. Uh, when you use the word directions for research, new directions in Palestinian studies, I think everybody got a little taste of what it's like at our workshops. And um, there's indeed been a, a concerted effort to dig deeper into some of these issues. I want to give a shout out first to some of the author, author, other authors and the issues that are being launched, number 83 and 84 of JQ, perhaps uh, we may have an opportunity to have another webinar featuring a couple of them. Uh, uh, in addition to yours and Lisa's, we have Karim Rabir's wonderful uh, political economy theoretical work on housing in Ramallah uh, and in, in the West Bank in general. Uh, an article by Sofia Stapadopoulou Robbins, Occupied Home Sharing Airbnb in Palestine. An article um, uh, by um, uh, Nimrod Benzev, who actually just made a comment uh, saying uh, there's research to show that Niftawis that uh, Nazmi was talking about were actually not just master masons to other Palestinian masons, but also master masons who trained Jewish settlers in Quaring in the 1920s. Uh, they had many Jewish apprentices. Uh, he wrote an article called We Built This Country, Palestinian Citizens in Israel's Construction Industry. Another one by Lauren Banco, Migrants, Residents, and the Cost of Illegal Homemaking in Mandate Palestine. Um, uh, Heidi Morrison's Unchilding by the Domicidal Assault, Narrating Experiences of Home During the Second Intifada. And one by Sabrina uh, Amrov, Virtual Reality 
encounters at the Israeli Museum, Palestinian homes and heartlands. Um, I also would like to make a plug for um, forthcoming special issues, uh, not only in JQ, uh, but in other venues as well of uh, our last uh, NDPS um, workshop on who owns Palestine, which follows many themes about questions of property and, and, and politics uh, in Palestine today. I wanna to thank all of our panelists, um, Lisa and Jacob and ones that just came in <laughs> as well. Uh, uh, I wish uh, we could make this more of an open workshop in the future. Uh, Nazmi and Khaldun, uh, the organizers again, um, JQ, IPS, uh, Brown University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to uh, throwing something else your way in the near future. Take care and bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.